Louis XVIII reigned from 1814 to his death in 1824, when he was succeeded by his brother, Charles X. Charles abdicated as a result of the 1830 revolution. Under the Restoration, no new building work was undertaken at the Louvre, but Napoleon's new north wing was extended to where the Pavillon de Rouen, built under the Second Empire, now stands. Work was also continued on the sculptural decoration of the Cour Carré. The Oeil de Boeuf, or bullseye circular windows over the doorways, received bas-relief figures on either side. These followed the style of those created by Jean Goujon in the 16th century on the Lesco wing, for instance, the figures of war and peace. Van Opstal's carvings of 1638 depicting power and riches on the Le Mercier wing had upheld this tradition. It was now renewed by a number of sculptors under the Restoration. For example, on the south wing, Nicolas Auguste Matt sculpted comedy and tragedy in 1822. On the Pavillon de l'Horloge, Simon Nicolas Mansion sculpted lyric poetry and music in 1824. On the north wing, Bernard Lange sculpted logic and eloquence, also in 1824. On the east wing, Charles-René Lettier sculpted justice and strength in the same year. Some interior decoration continued under the Restoration, We've already seen Charles Meignet's ceiling for the Grand Staircase of 1819. The upper floor of the entrance to the museum, the Roton de d'Apollon, also had its ceiling decorated at this time. Mary Joseph Blondel depicted there the fall of Icarus. The former guardroom above the Salle des Cariatides in the Lesco wing had been subdivided in the 18th century to make rooms on two floors. Louis XVIII had it restored in 1819 to be the venue for royal sittings of the chambers of deputies and peers. This 1843 painting by Charles Caius Renoux shows the room at the opening of the session on the 29th of January, 1823. Under Charles X, a suite of four rooms in the Le Mercier wing was allotted to the Conseil d'État, or Council of State, in 1824. The first northernmost room, the antechamber, had another painting by Marie-Joseph Blondel, created in 1828, France victorious at Bouvines. At the Battle of Bouvines in 1214, the French, led by King Philippe Auguste, defeated an army led by the Holy Roman Emperor Otto IV. The victory forced King John to hand the English-occupied territory of Anjou back to France. In the second room of the Council of State, the Great Council Chamber, the same painter created in 1826-7, France receives the Constitutional Charter from Louis XVIII. On the ceiling of the third room, the chamber of the litigation committee, Michel Martin Drolling painted Law Descending to Earth. The fourth ceiling, 
in the conference room shows divine wisdom giving the laws to kings and legislators, painted by Jean-Baptiste Moses in 1827. All these allegorical themes emphasize the higher monarchical or divine powers on which law and victory depend, and from which they may flow down to inferior earthly beings. They reflect the ultra-royalist views of Charles X, which led to the 1830 revolution and his exile. Restoration monarchs continued the series of exhibitions of products of French industry which had begun during the revolution. The first, in 1798, had been on the Champ de Mars. The second and third, in 1801 and 1802, had used the Cour Carré of the Louvre. The fourth, in 1806, had taken place on the Esplanade of the Invalides. Under Louis XVIII, the fifth took place inside the buildings of the Louvre, which Percier and Fontaine had completed work on, but which were not yet part of the museum. There were two more such exhibitions in the Louvre, in 1823, under Louis XVIII, and in 1827, under Charles X. By this time, the museum had occupied more of the rooms in the Louvre, and the space for exhibitors was limited. Subsequent exhibitions took place in the Place de la Concorde and the Champs-Élysées. National industrial exhibitions were superseded by international ones, the first in London in 1851. The annual Salon exhibitions of paintings and sculpture continued to take place in the Louvre during the Restoration. In 1819, for instance, Jericho's Raft of the Medusa was displayed there and was awarded a gold medal. In the following year, it was shown in London. It was Jericho who encouraged John Constable to exhibit at the Paris Salon. The Haywain and the view on the star was shown in the Louvre Salon in 1824 and inspired more enthusiastic admiration in France than in England. Among Constable's French admirers were Delacroix and Bonington. Constable was awarded a gold medal by King Charles X. Jericho's Raft of the Medusa was bought by the Louvre after his death in 1824. Nicolas Sébastien Maillet's painting of the Salon Carré of the Louvre shows the Raft of the Medusa hung alongside works by Poussin, Claude, Rembrandt and Caravaggio. The Haywain would also hang in that museum had the director and keeper of painting of the Louvre been successful in their efforts to purchase it. The Salon ended its connection with the Louvre when it became part of the Universal Exhibition of 1855 which took place in the Palais de l'Industrie, purpose-built in 1853. The salons continued to be held there until the building was demolished in 1896. Both Restoration monarchs, however, supported the Louvre as a museum and acquired between them over 7,000 objects. 
Louis XVIII's best-known acquisition was the Venus de Milo, discovered in 1820 and presented to him by the Marquis de Rivière. Louis XVIII is also responsible for retaining in the Louvre some of the objects acquired by Napoleon which were due to be returned to their original owners. The Emperor's booty included the Albani collection of antique sculptures put together by Cardinal Alessandro Albani and displayed in the Villa Albani. The owner in 1815, Prince Albani, was reluctant to pay for the transport back to Italy of his heavy statues. Most of them were sold to King Ludwig I of Bavaria and are now in Munich. Louis XVIII bought twenty of them and made exchanges to retain others. Among those remaining in the Louvre are Roman sculptures of the first and second centuries. The Albani Lion, the Sarcophagus of the Muses, statues of Alexander the Great and the Sitting Captive, and busts of Tiberius and Demosthenes. Charles X wanted to expand the museum under his name. The many works of art returned to their original owners after the fall of Napoleon, particularly the antiquities from the Vatican, had left a huge gap. Four large collections were bought with the aim of making up for this loss. On the 2nd of March, 1825, the contract was signed for the purchase of the collection of Edme Antoine Durand for 480,000 francs, worth just under £2 million in 2020. Charles X acquired 2,149 objects for the Louvre's Egyptian collection, as well as Greek vases, bronzes, medieval enamels, and Renaissance ceramics. Among them were this ivory diptych of the Muses, dating from the 5th century AD, and the coffin of Soutimes, chief scribe of the House of Amun in the New Kingdom's 18th dynasty. The second Egyptian collection of Henry Salt was sold to France in 1826 for 250,000 francs, about a million pounds in today's money. The Louvre gained 4,014 objects in this collection. They included the pink granite sphinx from Tanis, the circle Cophagus of Ramses the Third, a stealer of Ramses the Second as a child. In eighteen twenty seven, the Louvre obtained the second collection of Bernardino Drovetti for two hundred thousand francs, about eight hundred thousand pounds today. His first collection formed the basis of the Turin Egyptological Museum. The 1,970 objects that came to the Louvre included the funerary stele of a father and son from Abydos, a flat gold bowl presented to General Jehuti by Thutmose III, 1482 to 1424 BC, In 1828, the museum acquired for 60,000 francs the collection of the now-forgotten painter Pierre Rivoil. The catalogue listed 397 items, but some of them were multiple. 
catalogue number 360, for instance, comprised more than 350 bronze seals. The varied collection consisted of armour, chests, vases, wall hangings, paintings and manuscripts. It included, for instance, this ivory mirror case and this burgonet that belonged to Henri II. The Louvre was now in the process of becoming less a gallery of paintings and sculptures and more of a museum, as many of these objects were of historical rather than artistic interest. They were displayed in eight rooms on the first floor of the south wing of the Cour Carré, which became the Greek and Egyptian section of the Charles X Museum. Entry was through the Rotunda, with the Galerie d'Apollon to the right, then through one small and one large room to the four rooms devoted to Etruria, southern Italy and Greece. Then came the Salle des Colonnes, followed by the four rooms of Egyptian antiquities, under the direction of Jean-François Champollion, the decipherer of Egyptian hieroglyphs. At the end of this enfilade was the southern staircase of the colonnade. The ceilings of the museum had paintings of appropriate subjects. The Greek rooms showed The Apotheosis of Homer, by Jean-Dominique Ingres. His painting, which makes no concessions to being seen from below, was removed in 1855 and replaced with a copy. The original, framed, is now hung on a wall elsewhere in the museum. Vesuvius, who is personified, receiving fire from Jupiter to consume Herculaneum, Pompeii and Stabiae by François-Joseph M. Sibylle, the Great Mother, protecting Herculaneum, Pompeii and Stabiae from Vesuvius by François-Édouard Picot. The nymphs of Parthenope, that is Naples, brought to the Louvre by the goddess of fine arts, by Charles Meunier. The Salle des Colonnes, with ceilings painted by Antoine Jean Gros, separates the Greek and Italian rooms from the Egyptian antiquities. The four ceiling paintings in these rooms are not all equally appropriate. Study and genius reveal ancient Egypt to Greece by François Édouard Picot. Egypt saved by Joseph by Abel de Pujol. With less relevance, Pope Julius II orders the building of the Vatican and St. Peter's by Horace Vernet. The Genius of France encourages the arts by Antoine Jean Gros. Charles X's inauguration of the Maritime Museum, 
which remained in the Louvre from 1827 to 1937, also played a part in the history of the Louvre as a museum rather than just an art gallery. In 1748, a collection of models of ships and naval machines had been presented to Louis XV by Henri-Louis Duhamel du Monceau, author in 1751 of Elements of Naval Architecture or a Practical Treatise on Shipbuilding. The collection was to be made available to students at the Naval Engineers School of which Duhamel was head, and it was installed on the first floor of the Louvre, next to the premises of the Academy of Sciences. This Salle de la Marine closed in 1793. A short-lived naval museum opened from 1801 to 1803 in the Ministry of the Navy. Napoleon's personal collection of model ships, known as the Trianon Collection, was added to other objects when Charles X created the Maritime Museum in 1827. It was installed in the north wing of the Louvre, and continued to grow as large numbers of ethnographic objects were acquired from voyages of exploration and colonial expeditions. These were transferred to other collections in 1905. The naval collections were finally moved to the Palais de Chaillot, where the new Maritime Museum opened its doors in 1943. The 1830 revolution brought to the throne a member of the Orléans branch of the Bourbons, a descendant of Louis XIV's brother, in the shape of the so-called citizen king, Louis-Philippe. He tasked Baron Isidore Taylor with forming a collection of Spanish paintings for the Louvre. The paintings, eventually numbering over 400, cost 1,275,498 francs and were displayed in five rooms on the upper floor of the colonnade wing. This gallery opened on January the 7th, 1838. Spanish painting was little known in the rest of Europe, and painters such as Velázquez, Murillo and Zurbarán were a revelation. The painter Manet and the poet and art critic Baudelaire were among those whose enthusiasm was aroused by the collection. Others were less impressed. The Scottish historian and art critic William Sterling Maxwell published in 1848 his Annals of the Artists of Spain, the first book ever to be illustrated with photographs. In it he wrote, It is no less true than lamentable that the walls of the gallery bitterly belie the promise of the catalogues and that a very large number of the paintings fathered on the finest masters consists of mere copies or, or imitations by scholars or admirers, or of baser forgeries, the refuse of the studio and the sale-room. Maxwell did, however, find some paintings to admire, such as The Adoration of the Shepherds, by Velázquez, and by Murillo, Christ and St. John on the banks of the Jordan, and also Murillo's The Charity of St. Thomas of Villanueva. Another collection also enriched the Louvre thanks to Louis-Philippe. An English gentleman named Frank Hall Standish, 
who lived for much of his life in Seville, was enraged that the British government refused to recognize his right to inherit the baronetcy as well as the wealth and estate of his distant cousin. He died in 1840, bequeathing his immense collection of books, paintings and drawings to Louis-Philippe. It was displayed in the Louvre in the Standish Gallery, above the Maritime Museum in the north wing of the Cour Carré. Both these collections, though open to the public, remained in the private possession of the king. When he was deposed in the 1848 revolution and went into exile, he retained ownership of them. After his death in 1850, his heirs put the paintings up for sale at Christie's in London, where they were auctioned and dispersed in 1853. The collection amassed by Baron Taylor fetched £27,635, 16 shillings and sixpence. The Velázquez Adoration of the Shepherds, which William Sterling Maxwell admired, and for which Baron Taylor had paid £4,800, was sold for £2,060, and is now in the National Gallery. It is no longer attributed to Velázquez, but ascribed to an unknown Neapolitan or Spanish artist. Murillo's Christ and St. John on the banks of the Jordan was bought for £660 by the Duc de Montpensier, the youngest son of Louis-Philippe. It is now in the Art Institute of Chicago. Murillo's St. Thomas of Villanueva was sold for £710 to Lord Northbrook and is now in the Wallace Collection. The Standish Collection fetched £9,859.19. shillings. One painting from it was bought by the critic William Sterling Maxwell. He paid 25 guineas for Thurbaran's Regina Angelorum. This painting was auctioned again in 2013 and fetched 290,500 US dollars. Only one painting, which was forgotten in a reserve, has remained in the Louvre. It is the Declaration of Christ by Jaume Huguet. One other returned to the Louvre in 1908, El Greco's Christ on the Cross adored by two donors. It seems that Louis-Philippe's only contributions to the fabric or decoration of the Louvre are two stained glass windows. Both were made by the newly established stained glass workshop of the Sèvres porcelain manufactory, which he encouraged. One, dating from 1838, usually just called the Renaissance window, commemorates the inventions, discoveries and works that distinguished the epoch of the Renaissance between 1450 and 1550. It was done for the landing of the Henri II staircase from a cartoon book by Claude Aimé Chenvard. In the centre of the complex design, Louis XI is seen receiving the first printed Bible. The second window, 
dating from 1847, was intended for the Pavillon de l'Horloge. It commemorates the reign of François I. Its design is simpler, containing a portrait of François I, a scene showing him founding the Collège de France, and a scene where Leonardo da Vinci dies in his arms. This window is based on drawings by Jean Allot, many of whose paintings of historical characters or events were commissioned by Louis-Philippe for Versailles. Both windows are now displayed on the first floor of the Colbert staircase in the Colbert pavilion of the Richelieu wing. Thus, Louis-Philippe's physical contribution to the Louvre was, in the long run, very slight. The artistic influence of the paintings that he had hung there was great.